now that I've given you a little bit of an overview of splitting and combining, let's talk about how a Java stream is constructed and executed. And this is really quite interesting. Once again, you don't have to know all this stuff to be a streams programmer, but I think it's really quite fascinating to see how it works under the hood. So keep in mind that intermediate operations in a Java stream are lazy. And that means they don't actually start to run until the collect or some terminal operation is reached. So they sit there snoozing away, doing absolutely nothing. And then when collect or reduce or for each or something is hit, then they get up and, and start to run. Think of it like um, anybody here who has cats as a pet, cats will sleep till they hear the food bowl or you know if the food can open and they wake up and they come running very quickly. So kind of the same idea here. You, the, the world is triggered when the terminal operation is reached. So here's a very simple example of this. This is our um, Hamlet example or something equivalent to that. It's a, a little tiny bit different than the Hamlet example though. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to get a list of words that are conceivably not sorted and we're going to go ahead and convert that into a stream. We're going to map everything to uppercase. We're going to filter um, only the words that start with A. We're only going to let things come through that start with A. And we're going to sort the results and then collect the results to a list of strings. The details here actually don't matter. What I want to show you here is what's happening uh, when the compiler compiles this code. So when the Java compiler compiles this code, what it does is really quite fascinating. It creates a linked list of aggregate operations. And so you can kind of think of this as a linked list of aggregate operations. And as it's compiling each of these things, it's building a new element for the linked list. Let's call it a, a streams node or something like that. Uh, and each of these things gets stuck into the linked list. And so the first element in the linked list will keep track of the input. Then the next element will keep track of the, the fact it's a map aggregate operation, then a filter aggregate operation, then a sorted aggregate operation, and then finally a terminal operation collect. And so there'll be a linked list that'll be represented in the data structures that correspond to the stream's runtime environment. And you can basically think of this linked list as being a pipeline with one node or one stage per element in the pipeline. And if you want to learn more about this, there's a nice article by Brian Getz, who's one of the Java chief architects, that talks about this stuff. So it's, it's worth reading to kind of get a sense of what's going on under the hood. Now, the way this works internally, because that's the point of this discussion, is to talk about the internals, is that each of these stages in the pipeline is described by a bitmap of stream flags. And so each of these operations has this little bitmap that keeps track of the characteristics or the properties of that particular operation. So here are some examples of things. So that here's, these are the different flags that they have. They have sized, distinct, sorted, and ordered. And that's, then these things mean different things, right? So the size flag, or if the size bit is set, that indicates that for this particular uh, operation, the size of the stream is known. And we'll talk more about what it means for a stream to have a known size in a second. Distinct means that the elements of the stream are distinct. In other words, there are no duplicates. The sorted flag means that the elements of the stream are sorted in natural order. And ordered, which sounds like sorted, but it's actually different, means that the stream has a meaningful encounter order. What that means is that the output needs to appear to the user in the same order as the input from the original data source. And these flags are basically a subset of the flags that can be defined by a splitterator. And if you recall, the splitterator is used between well, the splitter is used to take the data source and split it up into a stream. So the splitterator will also keep track of whether or not things are sized, whether they're distinct, whether they're sorted, whether they're ordered. And when we talk a little bit more about how collections implement splitterators in the streams framework, you will see that when you implement the splitterator method, you have to set these flags as the splitterator implementor. Now, again, out of the box, 
Splitterator implementation is done usually by whoever wrote the Java collections framework. So whoever the authors were, they, they kept track of that. So most of the time, that's an implementation detail. But if you're implementing your own splitterator, you should keep track of that and then set those flags appropriately. So here's some examples of how these flags are set based on what the splitterator is doing. So if you take a look at these are just some of the some of the common collections that appear in the Java collections framework. So array list, hash set, tree set, hash map, and so on. And I've basically just illustrated some of the key ones here to, to show the differences between these different collections that you hopefully are familiar with and these different flags that we just talked about. So let's take a look at array list. So recall array list, you implemented something very much like array list. And array list is sized. In other words, you know how big it is. It's the number of elements that are in the array list, right? It's not, in, it's not an infinite sequence. It's sized with n, where n is the number of elements. And it's also ordered, where ordered means that it's, you know, zero, location zero, location one, location two, location three. So that, that means that there's an ordering to it. Doesn't mean it's sorted, just means that it's ordered from zero, one, two, three, up to size minus one. But there's no reason why array lists need to be sorted, so that flag isn't set. And there's no reason why the elements in an array list need to be distinct. So that flag isn't set. Okay. So now let's talk about hash set. So hash set is a set that's implemented using hashing. Well, what are the characteristics about that? Once again, you know the size, right? There were n elements in the collection. So when you splitterated it, there were still elements and elements in the stream. So the sized bit is set. And because it's a set, we know it's distinct. Because remember, by definition, sets cannot contain duplicates. However, hashing doesn't have any particular ordering. It's just whatever it hashes to. And there's no reason why the hash set should be sorted, because it's hashed, not sorted. So those flags are not set. And then the final example, and, and of course there's many other ones, but the one I wanted to show you here just to demonstrate the diversity of different flag settings, tree set. So tree set is a set, so that means it's distinct. It's a tree, so that means it's sorted. The size is known in advance, so it's going to be um, sized. And it's also ordered because the ordering is it's sorted. So it's going to be like, you know, if, if there's n elements, it'll be the first element, which would be the first lowest one, then the second lowest one, the third lowest one, and so on. So it's sorted and ordered. So that one's kind of interesting because it includes all those different properties. OK, so that's basically what happens. When we start out, the splitterator says something about the data. And there are methods, factory methods, we've talked about for creating streams that will create streams that are not sized. So you might think, well, aren't they always sized? Because all these collections always have a size. Generate and iterate are stream factory methods that will create streams that are not sized. Because we don't know in advance how big they're going to be. And they're typically going to be you know, bounded because you, you typically don't want your programs to run forever, uh, they'll be bounded by using something like limit or you know, find any, find first, or something like that. Uh, find any is not going to bound it, but find, find, for, find, um, find first, well, that actually may not bound it either. Limit will bound it. <laughs> so, but that wouldn't be something that would be set by the factory method itself. OK, so now here's the interesting part. Remember the stream? As the compiler is parsing your program, it's going to be building up this linked list data structure with each node in the linked list corresponding to a phase in the stream, including the source and the intermediate operations and the terminal operations. And what's interesting is that each intermediate operation that's in the stream will affect the flags that were initially set at the beginning. So what the heck does that mean? Well, if you have a map operation in your stream, then the stream flag data structure that is keeping track of the properties of map has to clear the sorted 
and distinct uh, bits in the bit mask, but it'll keep sized. Why is that? Because map conceivably can change the contents of the data. So if you had a stream of numbers, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, um, map could turn them all to zeros, right? So it, it wouldn't necessarily be distinct anymore. And likewise, map could rearrange them. That'd be kind of weird, but you could, you know, add some random number. Map could add a random number to the input elements. So even if they were sorted, they would come out not sorted. So map doesn't have any assurance that the stream that comes out of it is sorted or distinct anymore, but it does know it's sized and it knows it's sized because map always returns the same number of elements in the output stream as there were in the input stream. So if there were n elements in the input, there'll be n elements in the output. So sized remains set. Filter keeps sorted and distinct, but clears size. And that's because filter can't change anything in the stream. So if the stream was sorted, it, it'll still be sorted. It won't make them all you know, zero or make them be duplicates because it can't change anything. But there may be fewer elements that come out of filter than came into filter. The output stream may be smaller, so it clears the sized bit. Sorted keeps size and distinct and then adds the sorted bit to the bit mask, as you'd expect, because it sorts things, right? So by the time you run sorted, it's going to go ahead and have a result that's sorted. So as this pipeline is being constructed, this linked list of nodes representing the stages is being constructed by the compiler, the flags at each stage are going to be updated. So there'll be little changes at each of these different stages. And essentially, the flags for a previous stage are combined with the current stage's behavior based on whatever kind of operation it is to derive a new set of flags that apply at that phase. Now, uh, this raises a good question. Why the heck do they go to all this trouble, right? What on earth is it useful for? Well, here's one of the examples that makes it worthwhile. One of the things streams can do, it's sort of like um, if anybody's familiar with databases and database optimization, you have this concept of query optimizers, right? You, you write your query, and then you pass your query to a query optimizer. It can optimize stuff. Same thing with a compiler, right? A good old Java compiler, C compiler, C++ compiler reads your source code, and it figures out how to create assembly language that's more optimized, at least in theory, than what went into it. So the streams framework can do the same kind of thing. And here's a good example. So let's assume, for sake of argument, that we have a set, which is a tree set, and it's got a bunch of values set into it. So it's a set of strings, like people's names, the characters in Hamlet, whatever. And then we have a stream that looks like, you know, tree set, ts, dot stream. So we have a stream of uh, strings. Filter anything that starts with a. So we only let things through that start with a. And then we say dot sorted. Well, if you think about this, when we made a tree set, the flag was set that said this is sorted, right? Because that's the property of a tree set. It's sorted. So that's fine. Dot stream, we have a stream of strings. That's still sorted. Dot filter, we haven't changed the content, so we may have fewer elements because we got rid of anything that didn't start with A, but it's still sorted. And then when sorted is seen here, the streams framework can say, you know, this is actually redundant. There is no need to even do this operation because I know there is no way this thing is not sorted by the time it gets there. So the streams framework will say this operation is no longer necessary. It's redundant. So I will just remove it from my linked list of these stages in the pipeline. And therefore, your code will get faster, smaller, better, and so on, because it can get rid of things that are, are going to be redundant. So keep in mind, you know, you're building up this linked list. And then at runtime, what will happen, the reason why these things are lazy is because nothing actually happens until the terminal operation is run. And when the terminal operation is run, it triggers something called an execution plan. And again, I think that the best analogy to this is kind of the query optimizer for SQL, where you write a query, you submit the query, 
It optimizes the query, and then it runs the query on the optimized version. Same kind of idea here. So the execution plan is picked, and that will then set all the wheels in motion. And the plan that's picked, of course, is based on the properties of the source, like the collection, for example, and then all those aggregate operations that we just saw a minute ago. So the execution plan that says, aha, I can do things in a particular order. Um, now, we'll talk more about this when we get into parallel streams, but for the time being, I'll give you a quick overview. Intermediate operations are divided up into two categories. One are those stateless operations we talked about before. So things like map, filter, and so on, and, and flat map. If you have a pipeline of only stateless operations, your stream runs in a single pass. It just, the terminal operation will start the wheels in motion, it'll start pulling the data from the source through all the intermediate operations and then collect them together. So it's a single pass if they're all stateless. However, if a stream consists of a combination of stateless and stateful intermediate operations, then those things have to be divided up and run in different sections. And that's, of course, because you can't run a stateful operation until you finish everything in front of it, right? It doesn't make any sense to sort a stream if you haven't got all the elements of the stream. So you can almost think about these stateful operations as like little barriers where all the stateless operations get done ahead of them. And then when a stateful operation is run, all the results from the earlier stateless operations have to have been consolidated. And then the stateful operation is applied to all those consolidated operations. So that obviously is going to be you know, bigger in terms of time and space complexity because you have to save all the intermediate results. And then you have to go ahead and run them when they're they're done. So examples of stateful operations are things like sorted, limit, distinct, drop while, and so on. And so those things will be running in, in multiple passes relative to the stateless operations. Terminal operations are also divided into two categories. So there's the so-called non-short circuiting operations like reduce, collect, for each. Those are the ones we've been talking about the most. And these terminal operations can process data in bulk by using the for each remaining method on a splitterator. So all these guys say is, if this thing is not short circuiting, I'm just going to go ahead and apply this action to every element in the, in the stream, because they always have to process everything. So I'll make it more convenient. I'll make it more optimized. We'll do it in one fell swoop. Conversely, if something is a short circuiting, like any match, find first, and so on, then the terminal operation has to process the data elements one at a time using try advance. And that's because after each operation completes, after each thing is done, you have to check, is it finished? Did it return true? Did it find the thing it's looking for? Um, in which case we'll stop, right? Because it's short circuiting. So try advance is this splitterator method that's going to do one thing at a time as opposed to for each uh, remaining. And uh, for each remaining, we'll run them all in bulk. We've looked at try advance and for each remaining in our earlier discussions about uh, splitterators. OK, so that's the overview of the second part of stream internals. When we get to parallel streams, we will go into a lot more detail about other aspects of the internal processing, because there's really cool things like the way in which you can have parallel splitterators, the way in which you can do various kinds of uh, fork join controls and so on that we'll talk about in a lot more detail. But for now, this is good enough to get us through the next part.